And we know that all things work together for good. It doesn't look good right now, God. It looks bad. It looks lousy. I, I'm very unimpressed with what's going on right now. But all things will work together for good for those who love God. And then somehow we forget the rest of the verse. But there is actually more to just saying, okay, I, I really do love God. But loving God is proved out or lived out by the second half of the verse to those who are called according to his purpose. His purpose for our lives. We are going to talk tonight about having his purpose as the driving factor in your life. Being driven. Driven can sometimes have a bad connotation. Man, that guy's just driven. He just, he's a workaholic. He just, he just runs himself ragged and, or whatever. They're just driven by uh, the desire to, for finances or position or something like that. Till it, it almost drives them crazy. But there can be a positive side to driven. And that's what we're going to go tonight. That what God's purpose is for your life you can and should, I should, be driven by. In just a few moments, we will go to Acts, the eighth chapter, and we will hear the story of an Ethiopian man who didn't exactly know what life was all about, but he wanted to find it. He wanted to find purpose. And the, and the scenario that he went through to get to that purpose made, whew, it, it basically brought him down to have a purpose-driven life. And that's what we're going to ask God to do for you and I. So let me read it again. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, this, this title, Purpose Driven Life, actually was a book written about 20 years ago. I'm, I'm borrowing the title. I'm really not preaching uh, or teaching the, the outline of that book. It was written by Rick Warren. Very famous book. Actually... It, it's one of those books, every once in a while a book just kind of catches and, and, and then it goes to another country and another country. And so this particular book, uh, Purpose Driven Life, also was uh, written Purpose Driven, then he wrote a sequel, Purpose Driven Church, and then Purpose Driven Student Life, and then Purpose Driven Workbook, and then Purpose Driven Who Knows What, and, and everything else. There were so many different ones. And I think there was like up to 50 million copies of this thing published around the world. But the scenario of it or the background of it, just so that uh, you're saying, I'm telling you about it now. I should probably tell you what it's all about. Give me the next slide, thanks. Um, yeah, let me use this one for now. His, his, his thought was these five things, these five things, worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and mission make for purpose of why we are Christians, or purpose for why um, the church is the church. This, these are the five things, very good. In fact, it covers the great commandment, the great commission. It just literally covers the calling of the church. I, I personally like it a lot. Now in the Assemblies of God, we actually use these words to call what the Christian's life is about and what um, the church is about. We are all about evangelizing, winning people to Jesus. We are all about worshiping God, exalting his name, lifting him up. That's why we, we give high emphasis in our services to, to songs and, and to continue to live in a song. And that our lifestyle of worship wouldn't be just songs, but it would be that when I say yes to God, I am worshiping God. And then edifying is the education part of what we do. Building up in the word of God, building up in the things of the spirit, educating, growing in the word. Then when you grow in the word, you grow as a Christian. And then finally, we might use just to have the another E there, we, we put empathy, but the, really it is compassion that we would reach out to those who are in need around the world. And we would in one way or another touch them so that it might turn their heart towards coming to God. So that's kind of what the purpose-driven life is over here. We are purpose-driven, but I want to bring it down smaller tonight. I want to bring it down smaller. I will use the term for our Bible study tonight because everything that we do in our walk with God and for God 
should have purpose. If we get together here tonight and, and it's all said and done and we all walk out the door and you turn to your wife and say, what was that all about? What was the purpose of that? Did, what, why did we even come here tonight? What was that all about? It, that means we've missed the mark of purpose. But the reality is that in fact, when we ask the word, what's the purpose? It's a good question to ask. Not only about our church or about a ministry, or about, but it's a good question to ask about your life. Well, what's the purpose? Why are you here? If you disappear tomorrow, and I mean, you people say this all the time, well, if I just disappeared tomorrow, nobody would care. You know, nobody would even notice. The world would just go on without me. And I, I, the world would go on, that's for sure. But if you're walking in God's purpose, it would not be as good or it would not accomplish what? It should have because God has a purpose for you. Can you say amen? Let's bow our heads. <coughs> Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, this evening that purpose is not a bad word to us or it's not a word that, that now heaps responsibility on us to the degree that we, we can't feel like we can walk in, in, in freedom or in, in just in the life that we could enjoy because now we've got too much purpose, too much responsibility. But Lord, may we see in fact that purpose and which leads to the very reason, the very reason God made us as an individual that we were formed wonderfully in our mother's wombs. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to see it tonight by the anointing of the Spirit, allow the story of the Ethiopian official to help us see. And Lord, bless it, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. We're going to make it. Remember that two-hour sermon? I'm cutting it back to four minutes. Okay. And I've already used up my four minutes. Sister B met me when I was 16. I didn't look much different. <laughs> but um, it was during that, that 16th year that, um, that I met Jesus as my Savior. And it, and it was during that time frame. And it had to be right in that area. Maybe 17. I don't think so, though. I think it was still 16 that... I started to feel God stir in my soul that one day I would be working as a pastor or a missionary. But it was just kind of a whisper. It was just kind of a light touch. It was just kind of a, well, it's there, but I don't really have any substance, to, nothing to grab onto and, and declare or, or, or say this is, this is the moment. It would be several years later in my mid-20s when all of a sudden st something started to click inside of me, in the inner man, this question started to rise up. It just started to rise up. What are you doing? This question inside me, I could hear it. What are you doing that will make a difference in eternity? What are you doing? Or in the context of tonight's, what's your purpose? What are you doing as a Christian? Not just as a person. But my highest calling, our highest calling is not your citizenship of, uh, of an American or something else or, or anything else. Your highest calling is your Christianity. So let me ask the question, what's your purpose? That was what was echoing inside of me. And it was that, that answering that question, which I would consider for myself a major turning point in my life. That burning question, what is your purpose? Do you have a purpose? Or, and I didn't call myself Pastor B in those days. So I said, or John, do you have no purpose? Do you have no purpose? That, that really bothered me that I could take 70 or 80 or 90 years up on this planet as a child of God even and not be able to define what it was all about. But because I did find the answer, 45 years later, I'm standing here haven't changed one little bit, Sister B says. However, that answer of what drives my purpose, purpose-driven life, has made the difference for me. It's why I'm standing behind the pulpit. I found the, the life calling that God intended for me, and that defined my purpose. That purpose drives, fuels, and motivates. Man, that, man just those three words alone, just to say that. 
just what would drive you, what motivates you, what fuels you. Wow, that, that alone has got to be uh, something. Otherwise, it's like the sermon I preached not too long ago entitled Aimless Christianity, where the, where the Hebrew people were delivered out of Egypt. And they got out into the desert and made some huge wrong mistakes, decisions, I should say, uh, sins, really, decisions that should have not been made. And because they made those decisions, they found themselves wandering around the desert. They were still God's people. They still had some miracles from God. God still took care of them. But they were just aimless. And what a difference between the nation that Moses led for 40 years and then when Joshua took the nation into Israel. What a difference. I want to go with Joshua. Not that I don't like Moses, don't get me wrong. But I want to go with Joshua. Can anybody say amen? I want to step into the promised land. I want to be able to, well, fight some battles. But I want to see a lot of victories because of what the Lord is doing for me. And can I say it then for you also? Because you see, soon enough, this life's going to be over. I mean, I know we all want to think uh, the days are long, but the years are short. And it's, it's just flying by. Just here, here I was, 16 now I'm not so 16 anymore, you know? And, and life marches on. And it, it's, it just gets there. One of these days, we're going to stand before God. You, me. And, he's, and we want to hear the words. We don't want to like, oh, I don't know. We want to hear the words, well done. Well done, that good and faithful servant. I want to hear it in two ways. Uh, let me put them on the screen for you. The first way I want to hear it is, he, that when God says, well done, you saw your sins, you saw how it was rebellion against God, you admitted your sin, you turned from your sin, you proclaimed Jesus as your Savior, well done. That's the first way. I trust you've done this. If you've not done this, don't let tonight pass until you have made this absolute decision in your life. It will be part of what will drive your life. It will be part of your purpose. This, I mean, you, can, you can't get anywhere without starting here. That's like just bumping into a brick wall otherwise. But if this is the open door to go to the second one, but the second way he will seek to say, well done in your life, is to say, now I had specific things I wanted you to do, and you did them. Not just I wanted you to do them, and then you said, well, too bad I'm not doing them. But I did them in my family, in my neighborhood, in my church. Can anybody say amen? Say amen to that. And that's why when we read verses like James 2.26, we get it because God has called us. Well done means you did. You can't say well done if it's not done. And so James 2.26 says, for as the body is without the spirit is dead, in comparison it then, or comparing it rather, so faith without works, faith, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to squish this word in here, faith without purpose is dead. So we need some purpose. So we want to we jump in this evening, uh, each individual person here tonight, that's kind of a long uh, driveway to get up here to the garage, but we're, gonna, we're up to the garage now. So now that we've made it down, all the way up the driveway, we're going to look at the story of Acts, the 8th chapter. If you do have your Bibles, you can turn there. Acts, the 8th chapter of a man who came to a crossroads. He started without purpose. He ended up having a purpose-driven life. It was a three-step simple process. Uh, I'm not giving you your purpose tonight. I'm only hopefully awakening your heart to the need to have purpose. And then when we come to the altar, you pray that through. So number one, number one, waking up to purpose. Waking up to purpose. Paul wrote these words, 1 Corinthians 13. That's such an amazing chapter. That's a wow chapter. Just everything in that chapter, just, they're just, you know, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. But if, that's, if that is the context of my spirituality, if that's how I prove that I'm a Christian, it is not the proof at all. True Christianity is how God's love fall flows through you. 
Now, sure, the power of the Holy Spirit is important, and speaking in tongues is like so important, but not the proof. The love is the proof. And then he gets on and on and on, and he gets down to verse 11, and he says, when I was a child, Paul writes this. I mean, there's, Paul's just got to be about the most serious guy that ever lived. I mean, you know, just, I mean, I don't know. You, you just have to wonder about Paul. He just like serious, you know? You know, you just didn't walk over, walk over. Hey, Paul, how you doing? Yes. And Paul was just kind of like, you know, hey, get serious, man. People are going to hell. We got to get, let's get, man, let's, let's get serious here. You know, I just, I don't know. Paul just is intense. I can see the guy's intense. He was so intense. But I tell you, this is interesting here. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought like a child, but when I became a man, there came a time in, in life when I became a man, I put away childish things. I put away childish things. Waking up to purpose or seeing the need for purpose. This first one is seeing the need for purpose. This verse points out what happens in every life or at least should happen in every life. It's funny, in our society, we put a date. You turned 18, now you've just gone from being a kid to being an adult. Boy, don't do anything bad now, because they'll put you in jail for a long time. You could have done it yesterday, no problem, but today, now, whoa, 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 or 21 or whatever, now you can go, because the date on the calendar, you can go smoke and drink and, and who knows whatever other things you can do, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of a foolish way to define when a person grows up. Because you and I both know some 13-year-olds who are like adults. And we know some 33-year-olds who are like, well, they're worse than teenagers. I'll tell you, we just know it. You see, but for a Christian, there is a, there is a goal, there is a, there is a marker, a, a place where we need to come to where we say, I have put away my beginnings and the basics and the elementaries of my Christianity, and I'm, I'm starting to mature and starting to become the man, the woman of God that I was born again or born to be. There comes a time when every Christian needs to grow up. Even as the Bible declares being born again as a starting point, like a newborn babe. Uh, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes, take the milk of the word, drink it, drink it like a baby drinks uh, a bottle or nurses. When that baby drinks and drinks and drinks, it just doesn't stay the same. But all of a sudden, little baby becomes big baby, becomes toddler, becomes elementary, becomes just an ah! or something like that, you know? So it just, they, they grow up. They grow up as newborn babes. So then, then taking the milk of the word is going to naturally bring us to a place of growth and eventually bring us to a place where we must step into a responsible position in the body of Christ. Meaning, yes, we can start as children, we can start as, as babes in Christ, but, you, but there is no place in the Bible, and nature doesn't even allow us to do it, yet alone, spiritually speaking, you just can't say, I'm forever going to be a baby Christian. You can't do it. You can't do it. We don't, I'm sick of changing your diapers. You can't do it. We just cannot do it. It's time to grow up. And everybody's, man, the shouts tonight are so wonderful. I just, I love them. You know, there comes a time, there should come a time when every Christian says to themselves, you know, when a kid's a kid, he may not understand. He, he's too young. I mean, we have, uh, we have a, a, a saying in the, um, uh, that there's, there's a certain age where a child comes uh, and understands what, that they're doing right and wrong. And I'm sure that that's a gradual understanding in different ways. But, but there comes a time when every Christian should say, am I fulfilling God's specific purpose in my life? And it is a great day for you, for me, when we ask the question, what am I supposed to be doing here? What am I supposed to be doing? What's my role? Am I just, am I just, when I actually see that I need to grow up, 
I need to awake to my purpose. That's what happened to the man in Acts, the eighth chapter. It took me a while to get to him, didn't it? But in Acts, the eighth chapter, here's a man from Ethiopia. He's riding along in a chariot. As he rides along in a chariot, he, he doesn't know what, what his purpose is in God. Let me read this. In Acts, the eighth chapter, there was an unnamed man from Ethiopia who came to that point. He had just finished another pilgrimage to the holy city. He had done all the religious things, and yet he didn't make, it didn't make any sense to him, and he still felt like he was without purpose. One of the reasons we're even preaching on purpose tonight is because it, it really makes for an empty Christianity if a, if a baby Christian grows to the place where they should be an adult Christian, and I don't mean age-wise, like, but I'm talking about in maturity, growing in, in Christ, when that comes and they don't find their purpose, it will bring an incredible emptiness to the Christian. When, when I'm old enough to be doing something, I've, I've learned enough, I've matured enough, I've, I've, I've come enough in my walk with God, and yet I haven't found out what God has for me. Where is your purpose? That's where this man was. And he was reading the Bible, but he was blind to what he saw in the Bible. He could not see it. And that's why Acts, the eighth chapter, verses 31 and, uh, 30 and 31 say this. So Philip ran to him. Philip was an evangelist. We could even call him a pastor. And he said to him, I heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, well, do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand what God is saying to you about about everything. And he said, no. I mean, how can I? It's basically, no, I don't. I don't know what's going on. I don't, I don't know what's happening. But all of a sudden, something awakened in him. And he said, hey, this is crazy. I'm reading the word of God and I don't know what it says. I am part of a church and I don't know what God has for me. I am part of the body of Christ, and yet I don't know what part, what member I am, whether I'm a hand or a foot or a, I, I, don't, I have no idea. The great day is the first step is to awaken to say, wait a minute, this is not right. I should know what God has for me. I need to find out, which brings us to number two, seeking out your purpose. Once you discover that you don't have it, there is a purpose to have, and yet you don't have it. Well then, now it's time to seek it out. Psalm 119, verse 2. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. It is a great day when people start the journey. Give me that next verse. It is a great day when a person makes their journey, a journey of seeking God. Praise the Lord that the Ethiopian man knew where to start looking. He was looking in the Bible. Sad to say, in our society, somebody has convinced a lot of people that the Bible doesn't have their answer. I, I, that's, that's one of the, I mean, you want to talk about one of the downsides or one of the, uh, the I don't know the word I'm searching for, but when they took the Bible out of schools, when they took when families decided that the Bible wasn't necessary to be even read as a family unit. I mean, you didn't take it out of school, but you didn't have to take it out of the home. Families made their own decisions with that. School, they may have legislated and said, hey, you're not allowed to read the Bible. Sorry, that's it. It's a, we not, we're not paying you to do that, whatever. Okay, I get that when they said that. I don't get it, but they said it. But in the home, nobody said to the dad, hey, you can't read the Bible to your family anymore. To the mom, no, you can't, you can't have Bible stories for your, your little toddlers or anything anymore. And yet it disappeared from the home also. And when it did, and when it did, oh man, things started going haywire. But I want to say how wonderful it is when there is a training and a teaching that teaches us that the Bible does have the answers. The Ethiopian man I, somehow, some way, knew that he had to go to the Bible Ethiopian man was religious, but he hadn't found God. 
And the story teaches us that by reading the Bible, by going to the Bible, he found Jesus. And Jesus is the clear answer in the Bible. We all say that. He went through the steps of being religious. In fact, I'll take that one. He went through the steps of being religious, but he needed a revelation moment, a time when the light bulb goes off in his head and he says, I get it. I understand what God is trying to say and his beginning purpose for me. You say, Pastor, I, I like this thought tonight of purpose. I like this thought of, of seeking it out. Well, I can tell you plain and simple, just actually expect God to give a lot of it to you through the word of God. Just reading the Bible. Oh, Pastor, but I've read the Bible. In fact, I've read it several times. I didn't find anything there about my purpose. No, you didn't find it then. You didn't find it the second time, but it's probably going to be in the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time or whatever. Because I know if we have a desire to find God's purpose for us, if that desire is this big, God's desire is this big to give us that purpose. So we can never say, well, God's hiding it from me. God's not hiding it. God just wants you to keep searching and seeking for sooner or later. God, and it may be part of the process, but God has a place for your purpose. Can anybody say amen? Oh, have you had that real revelation moment? This one, this one, I right, just take a moment and read it. Would you read it? If you can't read, ask the person beside you to read it to you. That, uh, just take a moment. I'm ever amazed that you, now, if this was a nominal church, if it was a church that didn't have the gifts of the Spirit, if it didn't preach salvation in Jesus Christ, if it didn't preach against sin and for righteousness, and, and if it was one, if it was just a shallow church that just really wasn't trying to seek out the heart of God and find the heart of God in many, many different ways, that'd be one thing. But the sad thing is that I'm ever amazed there are people in Assemblies of God churches which means you and me. I'm, I'm not just pointing fingers at you. Let's say you and me together can sit there for years and not come to a complete understanding that, re that to really know Christ will always result in a dedicated life in serving Jesus. It, it cannot come out any other way. You can't mix all of these, put it in an oven and pull it out and get anything but a cake. You just can't pull it out and get anything but a life that's serving Jesus. And that is the call for you and I. Anything less, and that's when, this, that's when this happens, anything less is an empty shell of religion, not a full life of purpose in Christ. And that's why a lot of Christians don't feel like they have a purpose-driven life. Give your whole life to Jesus. When you give your whole life, he's just waiting. He's just waiting. So we've got to discover it. Then we have, to, we have to discover our need of it. Then we have to seek it out. And then while we do that, we will actually, point number three, we will find true purpose. We will find true purpose. We wrap it up with this. If you believe with all your heart, you may, because he'd asked if you could be baptized. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. The doorway to finding God's purpose in your life will always be to start receiving Jesus as your Savior and affirm Jesus as your Savior. You say, I don't know what my purpose is. When's the last time you just simply, in your prayer time, in your relationship, in your communion with Jesus, just said, Jesus, you're my Savior. You're my all in all. You, you've forgiven my sin. You've, you've washed me clean. You just... Just as it were, reaffirm your relationship with him. Like the Ethiopian eunuch did for the very first time. And when that happens, something interesting happens. Because if Jesus is your Lord, then there's going to be a next step. Jesus never saves us and then puts us down. He saves us and then says, okay, now let's go over here. And then he says, let's go over here. And then he says, let's go over here. And so look at this. Our lives in Jesus will be a lifetime of finding out what his next step for each of us is. What's the next step? A vibrant, purpose-driven life will come to those who understand God has a will for their lives every single day. Give me this next slide, thanks. 
It says, waking up in the morning, it has to be on our lips. Remember I sometimes say the best slide of them all? Which one gets the prize for the best slide? You're looking at it. You are looking at it right now. Get out your cameras. I mean, if you want to come and take a picture afterwards, put it on your Christmas card, whatever you want to do. But let's, this is the best one of them all. Here is the best thing. When you wake up in the morning, it has to be on our lips. Lord, what is your will for me today? Now listen. And this is where people go a little goofy. That doesn't mean that your life won't have routine in it. Oh, my life's the same as it was yesterday. And it's not going to change anything tomorrow. And, and I, there are times in our lives where we feel like all we're doing is chasing our tail. We're on a merry-go-round and all we have to do is, is just kind of blink. Hey, I think I just saw that. And blink. And, hey, I just saw that again. And blink. Sometimes life has a lot of routine in it. But life will not be boring, even with lots of routine. That doesn't mean your life won't have routine in it. But in that routine, you will know God's will is being fully, completely fulfilled. Can somebody say amen? There it is. That's, that's the winner for tonight. That was worth coming to church for right there. Because how many Christians say, oh, oh, nothing ever changes for me. I'm so, and then they get, and they dare to say this. A step back, a lightning bolt might hit them. I'm so bored with being a Christian. Watch out. I tell you, do not do that. There's nothing more exciting than serving Jesus. See, this Ethiopian eunuch realized that a relationship with God isn't about being a religious robot, but in fact, it's a real vibrant and has a real vibrant element of life in its relationship. So I'm just going to kind of wrap this up. I think I've used up all my time. Just take me to that next one. Instead of being an aimless Christian, we can, in fact, should be those purpose-driven ones. You can be sure that the next day he was asking, now what is God's next step, his will for me today? And then the next day he was saying, now what's God's next step for me this day? Why? Because a transition had taken place in his life. His life was defined by purpose, by Jesus. That's the way every one of us, me, you, should have a life. And that's the exciting life. That's the life that's not boring, even if it has routine. It's not boring. Now, do you know that 100%? Here's my guess. Probably not. Do you know 50% of it? Good. Do you know 75%? Well, good. Do you know 95%? Well, good. If, if you're in some of those percentages. If you only know 25%, well. But here's an opportunity tonight. As we get ready to close in prayer, I'm going to invite you to come to this altar. And... And I already made, I already sent an order into heaven before service, before service, before we even started service. I said, Lord, when people come and bow down, would you pour into them a new measure of understanding of what their purpose is so they might have a purpose driven life? If they will come to you, see the need of purpose, then seek your purpose. They will find true purpose in the Lord, purpose driven life. Let's bow our heads.